The Athena Ronnie Show. Welcome back to the Athena Ronnie Show. If you know anything about Athena at all, you know that I am the world's biggest Disney nut. And I mean, it is. it has been my world for forever, for as long as I can remember. My mom actually started the tradition of our family going to Disney and us being Disney nuts, as you would say. Uh, so I'm one of those Disney adult nuts still. We actually go all the time. We're Disney Vacation Club members. We um, are annual pass holders every year. I live in Tennessee and I've probably been to Disney over a hundred times, a hundred trips since I was little. My mom would pick us up or wake us up in the middle of the night and go, hey, wake up, we're going to Disney. And of course, as little kids, we were like, oh, you know, so now I've started that tradition with my kids, which is so much fun. My daughter's 16 in a few months, or actually, oh my gosh, in one month, she'll be 16 years old. And instead of having the big prom type birthday bash that mommy wanted to have, she is going to Disney for her birthday and taking some of her friends. So that's going to be her 60th birthday blowout at Disney. So I've raised my kids right, I'd love to say. No. <laughs> so the person we have on the show with us today, I'm so beyond honored. So I would like to introduce the man who created Jessica freaking rabbit. So welcome to the show, Gary K. Wolf. Hey, how you doing? Nice to be here. I I, ad I admire your allegiance to Disney. And I think uh, you got to be careful when you go there because they're going to think you're one of those princesses. You, you are just the most beautiful woman. <laughs> Thank you so much. So in other words, I inspired your character, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> sure, you can take credit for that. Absolutely. I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna negate that. Absolutely. <laughs> I would like to have that body actually. It, you know, can you show me how you drew that so I can just draw that onto myself? Uh, yeah, you actually wouldn't like that body because there's only one store where she can buy, uh, where she can buy clothes and uh, <laughs> it's like a <laughs> two hour drive. So uh, now nah, you'd be happy. You'd be happier with a normal everyday body. Believe me. <laughs> that is so great. So what an amazing, amazing legacy you have to have created something so iconic. Yeah, I, I, I think about that a lot. I, uh, I I grew up in a little farm town in Illinois. I, I wasn't a, I wasn't a farm boy. My, my dad ran the pool hall and my my mother worked in the school cafeteria. And um, if I had ever I, I, I never in my wildest dreams thought when I was when I was a kid growing up that someday uh, my characters, things that I created would be on T-shirts and, and, and hats and um, they would they would be known Jessica Jessica Rabbit especially is known around the world. She's an iconic character. Uh, and I, I look at that and I say, where did this come from? I, I mean, uh, that, it, it's 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 a miracle to me that that happened. Yeah, yeah, it is absolutely a dream of mine. So I'm jealous, way well, beyond jealous of well, that. Because, you, got a, you got a ways to yeah. go yet. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> life ain't over. Keep keep plugging away. Um, <laughs> yeah, to do know, anything Disney would be a dream come true for me. So yeah, yeah I'm I'm jealous of your life. Yes. Well. It, it, you know, it wasn't an I'm, I wasn't an overnight success. I mean, I didn't just all of a sudden one day say, "Oh wow, Roger and Jessica Rabbit," and the next day there they were, and the day after that they were on T-shirts. Uh, it, it was a long, long, hard process, and uh, filled with starts and stops and and lots of disappointments along the way. So, can you tell us a little bit about the process and how? Oh, that sure. Happened? Oh, absolutely. What happened? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, it, it really started. Uh, it started all started when I was a kid. I was probably in the second or third grade, and um, my my teacher uh, gave us all a, a picture to color. And the object of coloring this picture was to stay inside the lines. That was the only criteria: stay inside the lines. So I took it home, and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna ace this because there's nobody better at staying inside the lines than I am. So I took it home, and I got out my crayons. 
and I looked at that picture and it was a, um, it was a farmhouse, typical, typical Illinois uh, scene, farmhouse, uh, a barn, uh, a meadow, uh, a fence, and one cow out in the middle of the, of the field. So I colored the barn red because that's the color barns are. I colored the farmhouse yellow because that's the color farms were around where I grew up, uh, you know, uh, brown fence, green grass. And I looked at that cow and I, I'm thinking to myself, you know, my mother always told me that when people were alone, that they got sad, they got lonely, they got blue. And I'm looking at that poor cow all alone out there in the middle of the field. So I color that cow blue. So the next day I take my, my paper and I hand it in to my teacher. And uh, the day after that, she gives them back. Everybody except me. And she said to me, she said, Gary, she said, I want you to come up here to the front of the class. She said, face the class. And I, I thought, oh my God, I, I'm getting I'm getting special treatment. I stayed inside the lines better than anybody. And she put that picture up over my head. And she said, class, she said, look at this stupid, stupid picture. She said, everybody knows the cows are brown, cows are black, cows are white. Sometimes cows are brown, black, and white altogether. Never, never, ever are cows blue. That That just never happens. She says, Gary, don't you ever do anything this stupid again? And she called my mother. <laughs> my mother had to go to school, which was a big deal for my mother. I mean, and so uh, the teacher told her, she said, I think there's something wrong with Gary. I think he needs some psychological help uh, because he shouldn't be doing stuff like that. So so that night, my, my mother and father called me into the living room and they sat me down. Uh, my mom said, you, you know, Gary, why did you color that cow blue? And I, I said, geez, Ma, you know, it, was, it wasn't it was me. It was you. you. You were the one who told me if if people are, are all alone, they get sad and they get lonely and they get blue. And I figured, well, if it's good for people, it's good for cows. So sad, lonely cow, I call the cow blue. So um, my mom and dad said, all right, you go outside and play for a while because we're going to have to talk about this. And so I went outside. Uh, I, I didn't think this was going to have a good ending because, uh, as I said, my, my mother and father were working class people. My father had to drop out of school in the third grade to go to work during the depression. My mother had to drop out of school in, in the eighth grade to go to go to work during the depression. The, my father owned pool hall in, in that little farm town. My mother worked in the school cafeteria. These were not what you call um, uh, well-educated urban liberals. I mean, these were hard scrabble working people. And I just didn't think this was <laughs> gonna work out for me. Anyway, uh, after about 15, 20 minutes, they called me back in and my mom said to me, she says, Gary, she says, your dad and I talked about this. And we decided that the next time you wanna color a cow blue, you go ahead and color a cow blue. And so she called my teacher and said, you know, we talked about this and if he wants to do it again, let him do it. We don't care. And there's nothing wrong with it. Hmm? And, yeah, and there's nothing wrong with it. So about two or three weeks later, uh, we had to write a, a one page paper on what we did on our summer vacation. And um, everybody wrote, oh, I, you know, I went to the Wisconsin Dells. Uh, I went I went to the Sandwich Fair. Uh, I, you know, I would hear and went there. And I wrote my one paper on how I went out to my backyard and I used string, uh, tin cans and tin foil. And I built a rocket and I flew to the moon. Oh, <laughs> the, the next day, the teacher passed him back and said, well, that was an interesting trip, wasn't it? Uh, and uh, I, I've done a lot of blue cows since then. Y you know, that was really the first validation I ever had of my creativity. Um, and I've still got that picture. I, ha I have it hanging in my office up over my desk. Wow. It's funny to hear that because you hear so many stories from people like Michael Jordan and, you know, Wayne Dyer has a similar story of how mm -hmm. his parents called and, you know, it was this big confusion about um, him being, a, you know, a bad kid who didn't know what he was doing and Michael Jordan was told he would never play ball and, you know, you have sure. people like in your, that like that in your life, but I think we think they're terrible, but they're actually a catalyst for 
what you became and it probably pushed you to draw more blue cows or color more blue cows and well uh, Roger I, Rabbit I came so. from that. yeah I, I think so i i do a lot of yoga and um i do yoga every day and actually today in yoga um the instructor always gives us a little homily and he was talking about stress and he was saying that uh that it's been proven that people that don't have a lot of stress uh, tend to not live as long as people who do have a lot of stress and the people who do have a lot of stress uh, tend to be more creative. And that's, uh, I, I found that's true in, in my work too, that I do my best work uh, w when my life is complete chaos, when nothing's going right. And, and I don't know, I don't know where I'm going to turn next. And, and um, that's when I do my absolute best work, because I think that is what focuses my creativity. You started, Jessica, from a book, correct? Yeah, um, I, um, uh, I I was a science fiction writer. I had written, oh, I don't know, 20 or 30 science fiction short stories, never had a reject, got them all published. And I got to thinking, you know, for the amount of time I spend writing a book, I mean, for writing a short story or, or 12 short stories, I could write a book. So I wrote a novel. Uh, my agent sent it to Doubleday. Doubleday bought it. It was called Killer Bowl, a uh, story of um, football played in the future as a blood sport where people play football using weapons. They play it on city streets. And uh, actually, a lot of that kind of thing has almost come true. I, I uh, anticipated mixed martial arts fighting. I anticipated the gas crisis. Uh, and I anticipated the internet, and this was back in 1976. Wow. So the the double A gave me a contract for three more books, and the second one was uh, was called uh, Generation Removed. Uh, the third one was called The Resurrectionist, and for the fourth one, I wanted to do something that um, was outside the envelope. I mean, I, I wanted to I wanted to break all conventions, and when I was a kid. Um, my mother, I, my mother was a good woman. And my mother said, you know, if you want to get out of this town, a uh, little farm town, you don't want to wind up running your dance pool hall. The one thing you can do to make that happen is to read, you know, just read, read, read. And the reading will, will set you free. Reading will get you out of here. But she never made, put any restrictions on what I could read. So, but I read, I mean, I read comic books and, um, I watched cartoons. Uh, I also read magazines that my dad read, which were true crime magazines. Uh, I don't think they have them anymore. I hope not. But uh, true crime magazines were magazines that had stories about true crimes, usually murders, usually ghastly, gruesome murders. And uh, when a murder occurred, a photographer would go to the murder scene sometimes get there before the police and take a picture of the body or bodies uh, and sometimes rearrange the bodies to make, yeah, <laughs> grizzly. Uh, if you saw a movie with Tom Hanks called Road to Perdition, uh, Jude Law played a photographer who did that. And that was based on a real guy named Ouija who did that. And that's what my dad read. Uh, so that's what I read. And, and luckily I graduated to a better caliber of, uh, detective story, Dashiell Hammett, um, Mickey Spillane, Mike Hammer. Uh, but I grew up reading comic books, watching cartoons, and reading uh, crime magazines and detective stories. And so I wanted to do something that combined those things, uh, you know, not easily done. So I was watching uh, Saturday morning cartoons one Saturday morning. Uh, for research, I told my wife, you know, I just I didn't watch it for research. And uh, I, the cartoons were pretty awful, but the commercials were kind of interesting because they showed cartoon characters talking to real kids and nobody seemed to think that was odd. I mean, there was Snap, Crackle and Pop and Tony the Tiger and Captain Crunch um, and the Trix Rabbit talking to real kids and and that that was okay and i thought you know what a great idea that would be for a book what, what what would happen if you had a world where cartoon characters were real what kind of a world would that be so i spent a year just researching the kind of conventions of cartoons 
and comic books and, and inserting them into a real world uh, environment and uh, came up with uh, a story that could only exist in a world where cartoons were real. Uh, I came up with my detective, Eddie Valiant. I named him Eddie after my father, as an homage to my father, and produced a, a book called Who Censored Roger Rabbit, which was a brilliant book. And, uh, you know, I, and that's, that's not my opinion. I mean, I've got 2,000 reviews to say it's a brilliant book. So I, I sent that to Doubleday as the fourth book of my four book deal. And um, for the first time in my career, I got a reject. They rejected my book. What? So you can't publish this book. And so I called my editor and I said, Sharon, wh why did you reject this book? This is clearly the best thing I've ever written. And she said, oh, I agree. She said, it's funny. Uh, it's, it, it's interesting. There's never been anything done like this before. You've never done anything. Nobody's ever done anything like this. She said, but that's why I, because it's so unusual, I had to send it to the marketing department when they were the ones who rejected it. So he started sending it out to other publishers and, um, he would sometimes send it out to different editors at the same publisher. And along the way, uh, it accumulated 110 rejects, it's rejected 110 times. Uh, in those days, rejects used to come in the mail. Now, I, I guess they, I don't get many, but uh, I guess they come by email or whatever. But in those days, they came in the mail. And um, my wife used to call my trip out to the mailbox every day, the daily disappointments. Because I'd go out and I'd come back with a fistful of rejects, sometimes five, and um, I, I didn't I didn't think that anybody was ever going to publish this book. But finally, in the hundred and hundred and eleventh submission, I went to a young woman named Rebecca Martin, who was an editor at St. Martin's Press, and she had just edited a big bestseller for them, uh, and um, so the president of the company gave her a vanity project. He said, all right, for your next project, you can publish any book you want, whatever book you want, you can publish it. And Roger Rabbit came across her desk and she wow. said, oh, this is the one I want to publish. I have so, goosebumps. I just have to say that I have goosebumps yeah. from head to toe. So, so, cool. so she went to the president of the company and said, here's the book I want to publish. And the president said, okay, um, I'm going to take it home tonight. I'm going to read it and I'll get back to you in the morning. So he took it home, uh, came back the next morning, called her into the office and, and <laughs> said, Rebecca, I, he said, I read the book. He said, and I told you, you could publish anything you wanted, but you can't publish this because I can't sell it. There's no category for it on the bookstore shelves. And Rebecca stepped up to the plate and said, look, you either publish that book or I quit. And so they published the book. Uh, albeit in very small quantities, I think less than 5,000 copies. And, um, it, you know, people always ask me if, if you had a time machine and you could go back in time, what would you change? Would you change anything about the way you've lived? And I, I the, the one thing I would do differently, if I could go back in time, I would go back and I would buy all 5,000 of those books because they cost two ninety eight when they came out. And now if you look on eBay, they're well north of $400. So I would have wow. bought all 5,000, put them in a barn somewhere and I'd be a wealthy man today. But uh, the book did come out and uh, it, it, I sold it in 1980 and it didn't actually uh, come out until 1981 because it takes a year for some things like that to happen. And in that period of time, uh, I get a call at home and, uh, you know, I answer the phone, the guy on the other end says, this Gary K. Wolf. I said, yes, it is. He says, hi, this is Roy Disney. I said, yeah, right. Roy Disney calling me at home on my home line. That's right. It was really, you know, I thought one of my friends had me off. I would have fell out in the floor and just died. Yeah, <laughs> no, nearly did. And uh, yeah. he said, well, he said, I read your book and I'm wondering if you would be interested in having Disney make it into a movie. And I said, yeah, get out. It hasn't even been published yet. How'd you get a copy of it? And it turned out that somebody at St. Martin's, uh, I, I never found out who, and I tried because I wanted to kiss him or her uh, full on the lips. Um, somebody at St. Martin's sent a copy of the manuscript over to Disney and said, 
you know, we're going to publish this and we think, think you'd really like it. And it turned out they really did. And um, I, it was the right, it was the right decision for Disney at the time. This was 1980 and uh, Disney was not the powerhouse that they are today. Um, they were making movies that were set to be the second half of double features and there were no more double features. So they were making movies that, that had no place to show. They were making movies about shaggy dogs and nutty professors and um, uh, the, the black the black hole and the black cauldron, which disappeared down the black hole. Uh, they were in danger of becoming a second rate movie production house. So they needed something that would leapfrog them back up into the first ranks of movie production. And Roy Disney saw Roger Rabbit as that movie, that if they could do this and do it right, this would make them a key player in, in the movie industry again. And uh, the other thing was, I don't know if you've noticed, but when you walk down the street, uh, you see a tremendous amount of people wearing T-shirts and caps with Disney characters on them, right? Well, in 1980, uh, their stable of characters were getting a little stale. Uh, they, they had Mickey Mouse, but they couldn't really play with Mickey Mouse because he was like the corporate spokes mouse and um, they couldn't really have fun with it. They saw Roger and Jessica as being new characters they could merchandise. Give me more money than I'd made for everything I'd written up to that point. And um, I said, you know, fine, go ahead, give it a try. I, uh, I really didn't believe that they could make a movie out of my book because the book was so fanciful um, and so clever and creative that I didn't see any way they could translate it to film. It's a book that's meant to be read. You have to read it and use your imagination and you see the characters. Uh, but, you know, for that kind of money that they're willing to try, fine. And for a while, um, they pretty much proved me right. They really couldn't get it together. And a lot of it was technology. They didn't have in 1980, 81, 82, 83, 84, they didn't have the technology that was required to blend live action and animation seamlessly. It just didn't exist. Um, so they tried a lot of tests and none of them looked good. None of them worked. So finally, uh, Roy Disney came to me and said, you know, we're not having much luck here. What would you think if instead of cartoon characters, we had them be costume characters like they are in Disneyland? And I thought, oh, Jesus, I'm going to have Fred McMurray as Eddie Valiant. <laughs> I'm going to have Dean Jones as the rabbit, Haley Mills as Jessica, uh, Kurt Russell as Baby Herman. I, I said, Gee, I, I think that kind of compromises the principle a little bit. And, you know, they agreed and they went on. But I, I suspect that they never would have gotten it produced if a couple of things hadn't happened. And one of the major things was that Roy Disney, great guy, uh, not a terrific businessman, got forced out and uh, was replaced by Michael Eisner. You know, Mike brought with him a guy named Jeff, Jeffrey Katzenberg. And uh, they had worked together at 20th Century, I think at Paramount, lots of places, and had a string of successes. Um, and uh, when they came in, they took over Disney uh, film. And the first thing they did was throw out every project they had in, in production, because that's what got the previous administration in trouble, all except for Roger Rabbit. So they did something that nobody had ever done before at Disney. Um, they brought in an independent outside producer. Um, and that, of course, was a little known guy named Steve Spielberg. Steve Spielberg picked Bob Zemeckis to direct. Bob Zemeckis had actually been offered the job uh, back in 1981 and had read the book and liked it, but he didn't think that Disney had the horsepower to do it in 1981. Uh, but now with Steve Spielberg on board, Bob C said, yeah, you know, I'll do it. Um, so uh, he brought in uh, Kathleen Turner as the voice of Jessica uh, because she was uh, she worked with him in Romancing the Stone and they got along really well. She had a great voice. I just loved her. I mean, she was just 
the absolute perfect choice. Uh, and then um, Bob Z uh, and Stephen and me, we had to pick a, uh, a lead animator, somebody to oversee all the animators. And uh, we all wanted Chuck Jones, who was the guy who uh, designed Bugs Bunny, among others. He was, you know, designed tons of uh, Warner Brothers characters. And we talked to him about it and he wanted to do it. But uh, the problem was he was he was elderly at the time. He was in his late 60s, I believe. And when we talked, when we sat down and talked about it, uh, the feeling was that the workload and the stress of it might kill him. So uh, we didn't do him. And then we finally wound up with Dick Williams. And Dick Williams was a American, but living in England, an English expat, and uh, had won the Academy Award for animating the Pink Panther. And Dick turned out to be the perfect guy. He had the perfect attitude, perfect personality, uh, extremely talented guy. So he sat down with me and we conceptualized what these characters should look like. Because remember, I had written them in a book and I, I'm not an artist. I can't draw two lines. I saw them in my, in my head, but I had never actually seen them on paper. So um, first character we did was Roger. And uh, Roger looks in the movie pretty much like he looks in the book. Uh, red overalls, uh, polka dot bow tie. Uh, Dick added the, the orange top knot because he thought it needed a splash of color. And Dick also changed it. He was a brown rabbit in the book. And Dick thought that a brown rabbit would fade into the background. Uh, and so he suggested a white rabbit and we did a white rabbit, which, you know, did not fade into the background. That was, it was great. Um, then we came to Jessica and of course, um, you know, Jessica, Jessica was my dream girl. I, I, that little farm town I came from back in Illinois, there were a hundred kids total in my school and the boys outnumbered the girls by three to one. So, you know, good luck getting a date if you were the president of the checkers club. Right. And so Jessica in my mind was the girl that I would have dated if anybody would have ever gone out with me. And I based her on a combination of uh, film stars of my era, uh, Veronica Lake, um, Rita Hayworth, Betty Grable, um, Marilyn Monroe, um, and also a, a cartoon star called Red Hot Riding Hood. It was a Tex Avery creation and Red Hot. If you look at the Red Hot Riding Hood cartoons, they're on YouTube. Uh, you'll see that Jessica is basically Red Hot Riding Hood. She's got the same kind of proportions uh, the same, almost the identically same colored hair, except Red Hots is up in a, a chignon and Jessica's, of course, is loose. Um, but Dick Williams wanted her to have that kind of outlandish figure. And the reason for that wasn't to highlight her sexuality, although that was part of it, but it was so that uh, Dick could prove that to other animators that she was a drawn character and not rotoscoped. And rotoscoping is a technique where uh, in animation, you film a, a live actor doing something. And then you put that on a, on a tracing table and you trace over it and make it into an animated character. A perfectly acceptable technique. They did it in uh, Cinderella, the dancing scene in Cinderella. Um, they've done it in uh, Snow White, all those all those women were actual real women, and they just traced over them perfectly. I did not know that. Yeah, I had no but idea. he wanted he wanted other animators to know that Jessica was a drawn character, and that she hadn't been rotoscoped. So the only thing left we had to do was um, find somebody to play Eddie Valiant, which was the most important role in the movie because it was Eddie who would convince the audience that that rabbit was real. Uh, and if the, if the audience didn't believe that rabbit was real, not all cartoon characters were real, then the whole premise was blown. So uh, everybody wanted Harrison Ford. Uh, Harrison Ford was interested in doing it, but when he found out it would take four years, he said, no, nah, I can't do that. So wow. then we wanted Paul Newman. He wanted to do it, but 
had to back out. Same reason, couldn't couldn't do four years. So uh, we started bringing people in. We brought in um, uh, James Woods. Uh, we brought in Kurt Russell. Um, we brought in um, all kinds of all kinds of actors. Uh, and they also wanted somebody who was well known and bankable. Finally, they found uh, somebody that was the perfect, Eddie Valiant, bankable guy. And that, of course, was Bill Murray. Now, so Bill Murray came on as Eddie Malian. It became obvious really quickly that Bill Murray couldn't convince anybody that rabbit was real because Bill Murray didn't believe that rabbit was real. He was wow. kind of, like, oh, my God, you're a talking rabbit. Whoa, what are you doing here? So uh, they bought him out of his contract, $1 million, and uh, kept looking. Finally found somebody else who was the perfect Eddie Galleon and a bankable star. And that, of course, was Eddie Murphy. That didn't work either. So Eddie Murphy got bought out of his contract. He got a million dollars and a Ferrari. And uh, we kept looking. In the meantime, over on the another part of Hollywood, um, Brian De Palma is filming a movie about uh, the Untouchables, about, about Elliot Ness and the Untouchables. And he really wanted Robert De Niro play Al Capone. Uh, but De Niro was doing another movie and couldn't do it. So uh, De Palma hired a little known British actor named Bob Hoskins to play Al Capone. Well, after uh, a month of, of uh, shooting on the set, uh, Bobby De Niro calls De Palma and says, hey, I wrapped early and I can be in your movie. I could be Al Capone. So Bob Hoskins gets bought out of his contract. So now he's got a million dollars and nothing to do. So we, uh, somebody said, Let, let's have this Hoskins guy come in and read for him. And I said, ah, there's no way. I mean, he's he's British. And this is a prototypical American private eye. And this guy's British. There is no way that he's going to carry this off. Uh, but they said, well, let's, let's give him a shot anyway. So we brought him in. And he he was performing on an on a, uh, empty stage. And he was the only one of anybody who made you believe that rabbit was real. There was nothing around him. He was making it all up in his head. And he he made you believe that rabbit was real. And he spoke with an absolute dead-on American accent. I mean, it was perfect. Um, and, you know, people are always asking me, do you have any regrets about the movie? And, I, and yeah, I've got one. I've got one really big one. And it is that Bob Hoskins didn't even get nominated for an Academy Award for an acting job that is the, the finest acting job I've ever seen in my life. And the reason for that, I'm convinced, is because he made it look too easy. Uh, you, you can't imagine what it's like to be standing in a warehouse with a green screen and nothing around you and making up Toontown in your head and reacting to it. Um, as one example, when he's handcuffed to the rabbit, if you look carefully, those handcuffs are on springs, on a spring, so that he's controlling his wrist and Roger's wrist. So he has to remember where his his arm is and where Roger's arm is, and then he has to move both arms and remember where everything is. And uh, just an incredible, incredible actor. When he's thrown out of the Ink and Paint Club, um, and lands on those boxes, he broke three ribs. And uh, we said, oh, geez, now we're gonna have to shut down production for a couple of months, let Bob heal. He came in the next day, all taped up, said, okay, let's do the lines. And yeah, he's an incredible, incredible guy. And I, he, he gone too soon and he did not get his, his due for that movie. He should have won an Academy Award, should have been a lot for it. Anyway, uh, after that, things pretty well, you know, rolled along. We, we made the movie and um, the movie premiered at Radio City Music Hall in 1988. And I uh, I was there in the celebrity section, which was the first balcony. And um, I, 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 I was excited. I was, it, it was amazing because I was going to see the movie all the way through. They had been working on the movie right up until the last week. They were still making changes to it. I had never seen the movie all the way through. Uh, I had never seen my credit on screen. 
to top it off, I had Kathleen Turner on my left and Amy Irving on my right. I was sitting between two of the most beautiful women I've ever met in my life. And I'm going to see my movie and see my credit. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, life just doesn't get any better than this. And, and then life got better because Kathleen reached over and grabbed my leg. <laughs> she whispered in my ear, she said, Gary, are you excited? I said, Kathleen, you have no idea. You have no idea. So so the movie, the movie went on to gross uh, in that year, $750 million. It was the highest grossing movie of the year. Also the best reviewed movie of the year. Um, went on to win four Academy Awards. And uh, as a result, gave me a four picture deal with Disney. I, I wrote four movies for them. And, um, you know, life, uh, life was good. <laughs> what an amazing story. How blessed yeah. to be able to do all of those things and to see your name on a Disney film. I never thought, I never thought anything like that could possibly happen to me. And, um, you know, when I die, if on my tombstone, it says, here lies Gary K. Wolf. Uh, creator of Roger Rabbit and Toontown, uh, you know, that'll be enough. That'll be enough. Well, that's impressive. Just an amazing resume. An Thank amazing you. resume. So I'm so grateful that you did this. I appreciate it. I'm grateful to James for uh, being together too. My pleasure. Me. Now, yeah. I'll, I'll, <laughs> let me close with one story. I'll, I'll tell you one story in closing. Um, when we were doing the movie, uh, Steve Spielberg wanted to make sure that everybody who was involved in the movie in a major way had his or her favorite cartoon star in the movie. So uh, Bob Zemeckis was the roadrunner in Wile E. Coyote. Uh, Bob Hoskins was Heckle and Jekyll. Uh, Dick Williams was Droopy. Uh, and so Steve came to me and said, Gary, what, you know, what's your favorite character? And I want to make sure it's in the movie. And I said, ah, Steve, don't worry about it. I got Roger, I got Jessica, I got Baby Herman. I think I'm covered. He says, oh, okay. He says, well, I want to do something for you. So we'll do something. So if you watch the movie, the scene where Eddie Valiant is driving into Toontown and he's driving through the tunnel, driving through the tunnel and all of a sudden the curtains open and there's bluebirds and sun and skies and everybody's happy and laughing and dancing. If you watch that frame by frame and it's only there for six frames, which is like six twenty-fourths of a second, if you look on the left, you will see that there's a red barn, a yellow farmhouse, a green meadow, and a blue cow standing all alone out in the middle of the field. That's so cool. That's awesome. That is really neat. <laughs> well, I hope that you just write 20 more books because well, I'm definitely well, I'm going working, to buy working on, one. <laughs> yeah, I'm working on another one right now. And... Um, you know, we've, we've still got, uh, I'm, I'm doing a couple of movies. Um, I, I keep busy and I, I, I never would have believed it. Yeah, you know, who would have thought? Great. Well, congratulations on everything. Thank you so much. Yes. Well, thank you again. I appreciate it. And it was an honor to meet you. Well, it was a pleasure being here. And you were one of the best interviewers I've ever had. Oh, and that's so sweet. <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate that. Well, you have an absolutely fabulous day. Okay. okay. All we'll right. See you.